Welcome back to Shifting Schools, the podcast that explores innovative approaches to education and the ever-evolving landscape of learning. I'm your host, Jeff Udick, and today we have a very special guest joining us. He's a renowned educator, a forward-thinking leader, a good friend of mine, and the author of the thought-provoking book, The Design Thinking Classroom, Mr. David Jakes. Now, before we get to today's episode with David Jakes, Trisha and I are excited to introduce something incredibly special to all of our listeners. As we all know, we're living in the future, and nothing says future quite like artificial intelligence. But let's face it, AI can be a pretty intimidating topic. And that's where we step in, because at Shifting Schools, we geek out in AI so you don't have to. Today, we're thrilled to announce the launch of our three-month generative AI cohort that'll be starting this coming August. Specially crafted for educators, this program brings the latest AI developments right to your door, or rather, your inbox. But hold on, we've got some exciting news for you. If you sign up before June 10th, you can join this incredible journey for only $175. Yes, you heard that right. After June 10th, the price will increase to $350. So make sure to head to the show notes or to shiftingschools.com and fill out the form and get in on this great deal. So what does this unique cohort have in store for you? Well, let's dive in. Every month, We kick off with a 30-minute live webinar where we simplify AI, explore its applications in education, and answer your burning questions. Next, we provide a ready-to-roll resource each month, leveraging one of our AI frameworks. This allows you to put your learning into action directly in your classroom. With the rapid pace of AI evolution, it's hard to stay up to date, but don't worry. We have you covered. We will provide you with a review of the most important updates and news items that have an impact on education and your classroom. We'll also share a curated short list of new AI tools for you to experiment with and our top three new favorite prompts for you to tinker with with kids. You'll never be short of ways to integrate AI into your teaching methods. Finally, we know that learning is a community effort. That's why we're setting up an optional Slack channel for all cohort members to share, connect, and together shape the future of education. All of this and more packed into three-month journey, bringing AI to your fingertips. So gear up, educators, because the future of learning is here and it's powered by AI. Again, to take advantage of that special $175 price, you need to fill out the form in the show notes or head over to shiftingschools.com before June 10th. Once you fill out the form, we will be in touch with next steps. If you have seven or more teachers wanting to sign up from your school, contact us at info at shiftingschools.com to take advantage of our team pricing for the cohort. All right. Now, if you're passionate about transforming education, reimagining the classroom experience, and empowering students to thrive in a rapidly changing world, you're in for a treat. David Jakes has been a catalyst for educational change, inspiring teachers and administrators to shift their perspective and embrace new possibilities. In his book, The Design Thinking Classroom, David delves into the power of design thinking as a driving force behind educational innovation. He offers practical strategies, shares compelling stories, and sparks meaningful discussions about how we can reimagine our schools and create learning environments that foster creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking. David brings his wealth of experience as an educator, technology expert, and consultant to the table, providing actionable insight and real-world examples that will inspire educators at all levels. We're also giving away not one, not two, but three copies of this incredible book, The Design Thinking Classroom, by our guest, David Jakes. And thank you, David, for donating those books to our Shifting Schools community. If you're eager to dive into the world of design thinking and revolutionize your teaching practice, this is your chance. To enter the giveaway, all you need to do is fill out the form in the show notes by June 1st. Don't worry, it's quick and easy process. Just provide your name and email address and a brief sentence or two explaining why you're excited to explore design thinking in your classroom and we'll put you in the drawing. Once the entry period ends on June 1st, 
will randomly select three lucky winners from all of the submissions. Each winner will receive a copy of the Design Thinking Classroom delivered right to their doorstep. And I'm sorry to say that this is for North America listeners only. My apologies to our international crowd. So head to the show notes and fill out that quick form to enter to win your free book, The Design Thinking Classroom. Now, get ready to shift your perspective, challenge the status quo, and embrace the transformative power of education. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you my friend and author, David Jakes, of The Design Thinking Classroom. And with that, on with the show. All right, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Schools. I am so excited to talk with my good friend, David Jakes. We were just, before we clicked record, talking, I think it's been probably close to 10 years. In fact, uh, yeah. David, uh, you might not remember this. I still owe you a steak dinner because the last time we were together, you picked me up at the airport in Chicago and took me out to an amazing steak dinner. And so at some point in the future, when we do see each other again, I still owe you a steak dinner and I'm putting it on the podcast so that the next time I see you, it's my, <laughs> it sounds it's my good, turn. Jeff. <laughs> it's my turn to buy, but sounds uh, good. We are here today with David Jakes, a 36 year career in education and the author of the new book, The Design Thinking Classroom. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. There it is, The Design Thinking Classroom. And, and David has also given us a couple copies to give away uh, here at Shifting Schools. So be looking uh, in your newsletter for ways to win a free copy of The Design Thinking Classroom. So David, welcome to the podcast and let's jump right in. Uh, why write this book? What was what was it for you that the The Design Thinking Classroom, talk a little bit about where this book came from. Well, you know, I spent I spent 27 years in public K-12, 15 as a teacher, and then 12 as an administrator. In my time in administration, I was looking for a process that could help us change uh, and improve what we did. I was in a very successful school, but you can always find things to, to add, of course, to, to ex- experience. So, you know, after, after investigating a lot of things, I started understanding design, looking into design as a methodology for school improvement. And... Uh, you know, I got into that and learned a lot. And at the same time I was doing that, I got an offer actually to leave education and join the third teacher plus design studio of Canon design downtown Chicago. Uh, so I, you know, I, I decided to leave education, took them up on their offer and I walked into 60,000 square feet of studio, uh, downtown Chicago with 250 world-class designers and I thought I knew something about design, and I didn't know anything about design. Uh, so I got to live it for two years. Uh, I actually was immersed in it, and uh, it was like a second master's degree for me. So after I left Canon Design, and I've been involved now with the design for 10 years and then eight years in my own independent practice, you know, as you, as you work with design, you understand the power of the process. You begin to look for ways in which you can improve, can improve the conditions of people, which is really what it's designed to do. And then, and then, of course, with a background in education, you say, I wonder how this applies to the classroom experience. Mm. And so design thinking as a process itself is a step-by-step process. At least when you look at diagrams of it, it's not that in actuality. It bends back on itself and it's, it goes both, both directions. And it goes all over the place. But um, as an instructional framework, as part of the pedagogy, it becomes a very interesting and intriguing prospect of how we can shift a classroom experience to a design-based kind of approach. And so when there's a lot of moving pieces in design, uh, there's a lot of parts in it. And, you know, for me, it was one of those things where I had to, I was actually had the good fortune of being surrounded by a whole lot of people that knew design. Um, and so I was able to absorb all that. But what was in- interesting to me and really why the, I wrote the book was to take this big, really com- not complex, but a very capable process right. and put it in to the words and of a practitioner, classroom practitioner. And uh, so the book itself is targets. Uh, the classroom practitioner is designed uh, through the lens of my classroom experience and saying, if we, if, if the teachers are interested in doing this, then what's the most logical ways in which to approach this? How do you step, take a step forward? A, a foot into the process? How do you grow your practice? How do you become a competent designer? And what, what is it all about? What are the tools and techniques? So that's what the book does. And that's really why I wrote it to sort of uh, provide an onboarding manual into the design process for the classroom teacher. 
I really love that. Why do you think this is the the right time for design thinking for the design thinking classroom? And I think more importantly in that question is how does in your mind does the design thinking process support skills for students that they need today? Well, that's that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's always been the right time um, to do this, and I don't think you know coming out of the pandemic, there's there's moments to think about where future of education goes. But I think we've always been interested in a more robust kind of authentic process for kids, mm. and so that's why my answer was you know it's always been the time to do that. Um, but you know to get started in now is is a great time to do that. Um, you know in terms of you know, the, you know, I, I have a tendency to look at the classroom experience as developing the knowledge, the skills, and the dispositions of an educated person. You know, so I, th- I look at knowledge. That's what you, what you know about your world. Skills is what you can do. But dispositions are more focused on, you know, the way in, in which people or learners, in this case, behave and operate. So, you know, we teach kids how to read. That's a skill. Uh, but, you know, it's always been my Belief that we should help kids develop a love for reading that lasts a lifetime. That's a mm. disposition. We teach kids how to collaborate, but it doesn't do any good if they're not collaborative, which is a disposition. Mm. So, the opportunity uh, with the design process, it's rich in skills and expectations for the development of dispositions. And so, it's a it's a really active. You know, the process itself, when you apply it to teaching and learning, becomes a very student centered approach. It's very authentic in the in the best kinds of ways. It, it shifts, completely shifts the role of the teacher to, to doing different things. And, uh, you know, it's, you're talking about um, a process, really. Uh, it's, it's human-centered, right? So it's really focused on helping kids explore the needs of people. So in other words, the design process begins with a provocation and a challenge. And I'm a big fan of, of having a course, if you want to call the course, be designed around a series of design challenges rather than moving, you know, the typical unit based kind of, you know, I'm a high school teacher. So, you know, focus on this unit based kind of approach to course design. I'd rather think of a course being designed around a set of provocations or design challenges that, that place kids into situations where they have to explore, uh, use the design process to explore the pathway to reaching a solution. A lot of people say that design thinking is a, a problem-solving approach, and I agree with that to a certain extent. I'm more apt to think, and I mentioned this in the book, that it's more about solution finding. Mm. And I was sort of playing with words a little bit there in terminology, but problem-solving, of course, leads to solutions, hopefully. But I think the focus should be on solutions for, for human beings and for people. And so kids have a real chance to make a difference in their school, in their local community, in the world, if they have a, a, an opportunity to engage in real questions that bring that bring that to uh, to them, so they have a chance to explore those. So you know, you're talking about a whole new kind of set of skills that are involved in that, uh, and that's the challenge. And so, in the book, I t- in chapter six, I think it is. I can never remember. You think I've read it so many times? I think I do it <laughs> like hard. But I talk about how you do that, and yeah. you know, it's literally. Uh, here's a funny story for you. When I started, when I t- my first problem project was problem-based unit I did was on Canada geese in the Chicago yeah. area yeah. with 14 year olds. And I realized very quickly that 14 year olds didn't care anything about Canada geese. That's the first thing. <laughs> and the second thing is they didn't have the skills to be, to engage in project-based learning. Mm. Well, my mistake. Uh, I thought they would have been more capable of that. So the book starts out and, you know, the way I define it in the process is I help teachers with 20 minute lessons that that target the development of design skills, mm. answering questions, asking questions, listening. Uh, you know, uh, as far as using your cell phone to record data, I mean, it's really important. The cell phones become really important in the process. Yeah, uh, developing interview questions, any of these little tw- twenty to thirty minute lessons. So it's all targeted on building skills that can be used in the process. Also designed to help educators become comfortable with some of the skills that kids need to know to be able to engage in design. And I think the most important thing is that they can use these skill, these smaller activities within the context of their current pedagogy. From there, there's a larger uh, 
process where we're now not just building skills, but we're focusing on process, so building process mm-hmm. connections. So how do we link ideation and prototyping together? And so there's those kinds of experiences. So now we're beginning to be more sophisticated in our approach. We've only we've worked on skills that allow us to engage in process kind of activities. And then once we get to the the the, the, the best place, I think, is then being able to give kids where they get to the point where they're able to start with a provocation and take it all the way through uh, the design sequence to come up with a solution, being able to implement that solution and make a difference for people. So there's so, so the whole approach is is based on, I understand that it takes a lot to learn, first of all, but it's also important for people to be able to step over that that cultural bridge of what teaching and learning or the expectations for teachers and what it looks like. You've got, you know, if you're an experienced teacher, you've got <clears throat> things that work. Right. And so we have to, re- I'm not going to ask you to throw all those things out. I'm going to respect the fact that you've got things that work. So let's build those together. A design-based th- approach, a design thinking classroom doesn't mean that you ignore all the good things that you've learned about teaching and learning. But it does mean that you're adding some new capabilities, having new k- kids explore new kinds of competencies that lead them to a different kind of classroom engagement that brings them to a new kind of experience that can mean everything for them. So uh, that's what I'm interested in. Um, I think the book makes a real nice case for that. Again, I'm really, my lens when I, well, the, the funny thing is I wrote this first for teachers and administrators and the editors came back and said, you got to choose one audience. Yeah. So I rewrote it again and then, they came back and said, well, a lot of these things are misplaced. We have to reorganize it. So I had to rewrite it again. So the book, literally, I, re- I wrote the book once, and then I rewrote it twice. And I <laughs> learned that during the editing process, the editors are not your friend. Right. Um, and, you know, it was, it was hard for me because I had things I wanted to say that, I, that they said, don't say that. Mm. So you have to learn to give up some things in the writing process. And I finally decided to let the people that have published books before, since I've never done it, Decided to let them give me the advice on how to do it since they were since they were the experts. So, uh, but but I think um, you know overall, go back to your question. Um, I for, in fact, I forgot what the question was. You know, was it you know how uh, can it help students inform the you know the, do the develop skills? Uh, you know, it's active participation in in a really capable process that that, that takes them down a pathway and all, along all those steps. There's different yeah. things that they have to master and grow into. Yeah, and I, and I agree with that. And I, I think a, a big part for me, and this is always a lens that I'm constantly looking at classrooms through, is how much times are are we asking kids to to consume versus truly create? And I think when you start to implement a design thinking classroom, right, you're starting to get kids. And I love the idea that it starts with a provocation, and just yeah. that by asking questions puts us in a different mindset. You know, when you have kids asking questions and coming up with, with interview questions and what, what do we need to know? We, we are engage in a different active, active, creative mindset. And I just love that about the design thinking classroom is it gets us out of this idea of just consuming and into a mindset of creating and creating new knowledge, creating new dispositions, the intersection between skills and dispositions. I love that. Yeah. I think there's just a lot there. Well, the other thing to, to realize is that you're placing these kids in situations that typically unfamiliar to them mm. or can be, you know, if you, when you have right. a really good provocation and it gives them exposure to people that in a lot of times are different than them, have different viewpoints, look different than them and so on. So I'm all about, I'm all in favor of, of putting kids in contact with people that allow them to develop an understanding of others, to understand different perspectives, be under, understand how to interact with people in different ways and build that kind of connection to people that are different than you, but that you understand that they're just people just like you. Mm. And we need more of that in this country, in this world, certainly. And, you know, the first part of design is based on an empathetic understanding of who you're designing with. So that the first part, even in traditional models of design thinking, you see the first part labeled uh, empathy, empathize. Right. Uh, I use a different terminology in my book, which is based on some of my architecture experience, but at the end of the day, you're, you're, it's all about human-centered design, connecting people with people, and sitting and listening. And I, and I find that still hard to, you know, I go into classrooms when I do visitations, and I have to have to really focus on myself to listen and understand rather than to evaluate. 
I mean, I spent 27 years in public schools, and when I go in the classroom, it's really easy for me to say, oh, man, I would have done that differently. Yeah. Uh, but you go you into know, that evaluator. Yeah, mindset. I go and evaluate the teacher, and I go, no, I'm not here to do that. I'm just here to listen and yeah. understand the, the, the situation. So, you know, there's there's that is something that you have to learn and, and, and be able to uh, put your biases and your prejudices aside. And that's a really difficult thing to do, especially when you, when you, when you're, you know, you're sold as I am. Uh, yeah. But it's an important thing to teach kids is that, you know, it's not about seeing that person through your lens. It's about understanding their lens. And, and that's one of the prime dispositions. You know, we looked at, you know, the pr- process, we look to help kids develop things like persistence, resilience, courage, bravery, uh, responsibility, empathy, all these things that, that, are, we miss a lot of times in education, but we're looking forward for a process and experience that helps them those dis- develop those really rich dispositions of what it means to be human, what it means to be able to connect with other people, and what it means, most importantly, and I make a point in the book, is, and this is what education in my mind does, is to help people uncover their path and live a life worth living. Mm. And that's when you're, when you're engaged in, as a human being with your community and others, uh, you're a lifelong learner, and you just get to experience the world. You know how to do that the right ways. I love that. Yeah. For educators who might be new to the idea of design thinking, what are some of maybe in your mind some of the most important things they should keep uh, in the front of their mind as they implement this in their classroom? What are maybe some of the first steps for educators? Well, you know that's a, that's a great question uh, because, like I said earlier, I had the I had the good fortune of being surrounded by professionals that helped me. Uh, learn the process. So uh, there's a bunch of things. Uh, you know, when you make a shift to to a design approach, you know, it's it's basically, for example, I'm. It's not this. I'm going to tell you about biology. For example, in my case, I'm going to tell you about biology. I'm going to tell you how it, how you learn it, when do you learn it, and all that's determined by me. That all goes out the window. Okay. So it's it's a complete. The first thing is you have to accept that your role changes. Hmm. And I don't like to use the word facilitator because I think that's not strong enough of a word for the elegance of what teachers do to, to design learning for children and young adults. I think it's much more elegant than that uh, term. There needs to be a better term. But, th- but you know, within the design process, y- you're a conductor, right? Um, hmm. You are a mentor. In the world of architecture, you're a project manager. Uh, you're, you're, you're someone who has more life experience. So you're a guide and maybe that all wraps up into facilitator, I guess. But the, the whole idea is that, you know, you're not standing and I make a, in, in one of the book, in chapters in the book, I used to, as an example, I used to tell kids about cell division. It was mitosis. If you remember that? Do you remember right, the yeah. five, do you remember my own mitosis? Yeah. To, tell me what are the phases? Well, I don't remember the phases. Yeah, so you don't remember it. You don't know. They don't, you don't remember it either. You know? <laughs> so they don't remember it either after two weeks, no. but you know, I'm going to have my overhead with my transparency and my marker yeah. and I'm writing notes and they're dutifully copying them down and they do real good on the quiz. And that that's all garbage. It's meaningless. And so I thought I was a pretty successful teacher, but I don't know if I really truly connected kids to the experience of learning biology mm. as they could have. So, you know, I would, for example, I would start off by, by, now I would be structuring that for my provocation may, might be how might we uh, develop, um, you know, some kind of solution or product to help kids that have been diagnosed with cancer. And that's mm. going to be, it's really a touchy situation because you might have some a relative or a family member that has cancer. Right. But really runaway cell division or runaway mitosis is what happens is that cells normally stop dividing. They, um, when they get cancerous, they continue to divide. You get a mass called a tumor and it impacts the body process or an organ, you have cancer. So um, I just simplified the most complex human disease in a matter of 10 seconds. But um, so the key question is, why do I need to know mitosis? Because it helps you understand cancer. And so the big question for teachers when they adopt a design approach is where is the authenticity in the content that you teach? I love that. It is. It is. Where is your entry points into making connections to why kids need to learn this kind of thing or object or whatever it might be, whatever your curriculum is, where the authentic can, that's what you base your provocations on, right? Give them a reason to understand why they have to learn this. 
Yeah. And that's what design is predicated on. You know, it's, it's, why is um, cancer so hard to find a cure for? Well, you know, right. that's a, a great question around just like, why is this? Why do we struggle with cancer? You know, yeah, that's all and part of it. So, that so that's all part of it. So, right. What do you do then? Well, what you're going to do as a, a professional educator is you're going to kind of be a connector. You're going to get that Zoom call with a with a local oncologist, and their yeah. kids are going to talk with them, and they're going to ask them those questions, right? And then they're going to visit visit. A, you're going to you're going to take a quote unquote field trip, and I and, and I'm not a big fan of different language education, <laughs> and I hate the the field trip. I call it the drawbridge effect, where you lower the drawbridge, you scurry out to some remote location, you spend two hours in a museum, and you scurry back and you raise the drawbridge again. So. What the design process does is designed to expand the locations where learning can occur, the mm -hmm. connections to people that are beyond the school, to those experts, those, to that oncologist, to that children's hospital where it comes to visitation. Yeah. You know, and so they go through a cancer wing of young kids, and you want to you want to talk about building empathy, do that. You know, all of that is 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 framed around the age of the student if it's age appropriate. If you can sure. do that, uh, but you, but you know, then there's a real reason to use technology, right? Where we, yeah. We lived for three years on Zoom. Now we've got a real reason to use Zoom beyond just remote right. learning. But, um, you know, so th that's how it kind of shifts, you know. So so here's this really cool question. And what happens is you learn that content anyway in the course of needing to know, to understand. They just talked about cell division. What's that mean? What's that? Well, let's take a day. You know what? I'm going to do a lecture. You know, so there's, you know, there's opportunities to embed some of that inst traditional instructional approach into the experience. I mean, when I taught an upper level biology class um, for juniors and seniors, they didn't want to take AP biology, but still want another life science course. And I, we, I had to explain homeostasis to them. It's extremely complex. They would not have understood that if I didn't explain it to them. It's just too complex. Um, but then again, at that level, at juniors and seniors, I don't need to tell them about cell division. They can you know, watch a video on YouTube and understand it probably within 10 minutes. Um, mm. You know, so you got to pick and choose your moments. But, you know, this is, this is, um, the other thing is the big hurdle for teachers, there's two big hurdles. One, parent parental ex uh, expectations. Mm. When's my kid going to learn about the Civil War? Um, uh, I don't know. You know, uh, kids never came into my, you know, I, I can't imagine a kid coming in the weekend and going, Mr. Jake's, <laughs> I've wondered all weekend about the war of 1812. Can you tell me about it? <laughs> you know, so it's like, yeah, yeah. Go to Wikipedia. Here you go. Uh, <laughs> you know, but so it's, you know, the parents went through school and they have an expectation of yeah. what that experience looks like. And when you start talking about not look doing it the traditional way, how does that play out? So there's gotta be, not only is there a shift in terms of what your instructional approach looks like and your classroom experience, it's also about education, educating the parents in the community about the kind of experience. That's one thing. The second thing is stepping aside mm. and granting agency to the kids to, to allow them to, to um, have the experience. And, you know, one of the things I mentioned in the book is my, my experience in my class was to A to B. Uh, so A is the start of the unit. Uh, B is the culmination, typically a multiple choice question. There's sequential lessons through that pathway. Um, what, what design does is turns that linear uh, framework into a, what I call a squiggle, where there's some provocation and you go into this, this mess of where you have all these other questions you have to answer and a ask and answer. And then answers to those questions point you down rabbit holes that you explore that you need to know. And ultimately, you come out of that with some kind of answer or perhaps even more questions that send you back into that squiggle. And so we're, you're in the uh, situation where learning uh, is wound up and it unwinds on itself, creates this complex of questions and answer sequences that leads ultimately to some culmination that's a question that has meaning or a product that has meaning uh, to the people who asked it in the first place. That's that's when you get into the good stuff, but it's, you know, it, to do it, it doesn't start, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, you know, give yourself some latitude to, to engage in this and try things, see what works and what doesn't use your classroom as a course. Uh, but it, take your time, but don't take too much time, get started and get better at it. Yeah. 
and go buy the book, the Design Thinking Classroom. Yes, it, uh, the, uh, yeah, it, yes, it is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, can you maybe talk about a case study or a classroom where you've supported a teacher and maybe kind of walk us through, uh, like what did this lo- what did this look like in a classroom you've been in where you've where you've supported a school or or a classroom? How, what give us a, a lesson to start to be start to yeah. Finish, well, there's whatever, there's, you, there's whatever you want to call it. There's plenty of schools that. Um, have adopted the design thinking model. Uh, there's Crosstown in Memphis. There's I got a list of them here for you. Museum and School in Grand Rapids, uh, Waukee Apex on Waukee, Iowa, uh, Mount Vernon down in Atlanta. Uh, but the interesting thing about design is that they all take a different approach. Mm. And the value about the design approach is you can make it your own. In fact, what I do, I've made the process my own. And if you, all you got to do is go to Google, type in design thinking into the image search and take a look at all the permutations that people have uh, created that, that through their lens and their perspective created a different kind of model. So there's some basics, obviously. But, you know, I just got back from a visitation to um, a school, um, the Delta School in Wilson, Arkansas. Um, small independent school and... It looks completely different than, mm. for example, um, they don't have they don't have freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. Um, they just have like upperclassmen in in, in their in their kid. They're seventeen, they're sixteen, seventeen, eighteen year olds have the ability to choose their schedule throughout the day. They have questions to explore, and there's things that they have to attend on occasion with with some of their teachers. But for the most part, they plan their entire day, and it's all about fabricating. And answers and responses to questions that, that matter to them. Allow them to follow their passions as, as, um, as a student at school. And so you start with three and four year olds that literally are designing and prototyping birdhouses, bird feeders, right? So you're in, in the in the Mount Vernon in Atlanta does that as well. They start kids. <clears throat> think about this. They start kids in kindergarten. That's where they start design thinking. And they scale it appropriately, of course. But those kids, by the time they're in, and it's what, four or five when they start? When yeah. they graduate, they're 18. So they've literally had 12 years of design experience. Mm-hmm. Think of think of the kind of experiences those kids have had across that trajectory. Think of their capabilities when they when they graduate and what they, what they can do, what they can demonstrate. And in, in case of Mount Vernon, they can actually graduate with an innovation diploma. So they can graduate with a regular degree, but also based on that, those kinds of experiences in the courses they choose, innovation diploma. Wow. So, you know, you've got uh, the museum school in, in Grand Rapids who had this place-based learning. Uh, so the school is actually in the museum. So all the artifacts in the museum become factored into their curriculum. They have they have physical education class downtown Grand Rapids on the skating rink downtown Grand downtown Grand Rapids so so the, you know um, it's this expansive condition where we create more connections throughout the community. When uh, I was part of the design team that designed Waukee Apex, which is or the Wilk, I'm sorry, which is the Waukee Innovation Learning Center, which is outside of out in Waukee, Iowa, outside of um, uh, Des Moines. Um, when we, it's a long story, but when we designed that, um, before when we started the first initial discovery part, we gave kids a map of Des Moines, in, in because the experience was going to put kids in contact with business partners as you know authentic partners in their learning. We said map out, map out. Here's your here's your whole map of Des Moines. This big twenty four by thirty six paper to map out your daily experience. Mm-hmm. So kids actually you know had to say, well, I'm going to spend two hours in high school and two hours in over in Wilk and then you know, half a day with my business partner. So, you know, what happens is um, we get stuck in education. You know, think about it. We've got freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors. We have faculty, staff, and administrators. We have Carnegie Bell schedules, periods one through eight. We have low ability, medium ability, high ability kids. We have all these containers. And these containers are put in place to help schools structure the daily experience. But the biggest thing, and when you step into the educational change and the expectations for a different kind of experience in schools, is the very things that you put in place to structure your school day becomes the very things that limit your ability to change because they're, they're mm. cultural. 
you ever tried to change a period one through eight bell schedule to a block yeah, schedule, good, you luck. Know, the dog, good luck on that. So, you know, all these schools, in a lot of ways, and to be perfectly frank with you, have the philosophy of design thinking. They've been built in that way. Uh, design Tech High in, in, in Redwood City, California, they teach a design thinking class. Kids, you know, it's all kids go through that. And then they have intercession periods where kids get to explore different passions through a design thinking approach. And then they have traditional classes. So there's, there's lots of different ways to scaffold it. It depends on what you want to accomplish. And the most important thing that the, bring, the, that brings, the book brings to bear is that an individual teacher, regardless of his or her assignment, can get started doing this in their class. Um, and, you know, start building in elements of design into their traditional instruction, like I said before, and give, give, this, give this a fair shake and see what the kind of experience it makes. Um, if your last school I was in was 3,000 kids, if you're going to walk in on, on in the first week of school and say we're going to a design thinking model, that's just not going to happen. So, with that, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, in, in Norse, you know, it's, that's just not realistic. So the problem with schools is that just are too darn big. Yeah. And so, you know, like, like the walkie condition, that was sort of an academy approach where you offered a design thinking community based kind of educational experience where kids were literally what it was, 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 um, the curriculum is fought with, it originally started out as five strands that were important to the Iowa economy, like bio agriculture, go figure. Um, and then you'd ask a question, uh, a research question, and then uh, you'd have a business partner that would help you through that. That's since morphed into a different kind of model, but it's still based in the design approach. It's not right for every kid, but it's right for some kids. And why not? You know, we got this college and career path. Man, if I hear it, college and career readiness anymore as an outcome of educational thing on the screen. <laughs> um, and we need more pathways before, besides that. And, you know, you can go to college before your two-year and go to go to work or you can go to military. I'd love to see schools start thinking about an entrepreneurial track. And so where are you within your schools? Are you teaching kids how to engage in startup? And what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? If you look at the U.S. economy, it's the amount of co- contributions from startups and in and, and the gig economy and all that. It's, it's, it's amazing. But we're not teaching kids on how to do that as much as we should. So yeah. I, I like the idea of, of design being uh, in your traditional school the opportunities for design to create alternative pathways for kids that want to explore that can. And so how do we build that into a school that, that where the kids still go to the, your traditional school, but there's additional option form that are, it presents different new opportunities. Mm-hmm. I love that. And I think, you know, as you're talking, I'm sitting here reflecting, you know, I, I'm lucky enough. I will say, use the word lucky enough that I live in a state that is very educationally focused and, and I think is doing a lot of really great things. Not everything's perfect. No yeah. state is. Um, but, you know, we've already have one of the things I love about the state of Washington. I've been working with administrators on is there are seven different ways now to graduate high school in our state. And we've got all these different pathways. Now, we don't have the entrepreneurial one yet. But what I do love is the commission is always looking for ways to add it. So that's one thing that I love. Right. Like what are the different ways other than a diploma getting your 27 credits, passing the standardized test. What are other ways can we somehow get kids to graduate? So that was one. The second thing is, is I'm having a lot of amazing conversations at alternative high schools. I feel like our alternative schools in a lot of districts, a lot of especially large districts have some kind of alternative high school where the, we call it the big box school doesn't work for a subset of kids. Just like you're saying, design thinking isn't for every kid, but it's for some kids. And yeah. so we have this alternative high school program where we're, I go work with these alternative high schools. There is more creativity happening in these alternative programs. I was just working with one down uh, here locally, and they've got five kids who are trying to get their high school diploma because they've already started businesses. One kid is 16 years old and has a food truck, a taco food truck, and is making a living in his taco food truck, trying to get his high school diploma because he's already out making, and I'm thinking, okay, the, like, and the kid needs to know finance. The kid needs to understand. I mean, there's all these things, right? And I'm but, just but, thinking, the, but the thing that kills me about it, there. the thing that kills me about it, how is school? How are schools going to approach this? Yeah. They're going to design a course for it. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So I mean, what are the? Here's a you know, here's a provocation. How might we create a situation where kids are learning like you know to have a run their own business in a food truck 
It doesn't have to be a course. No. I mean, how do we structure education in such a way where we start rethinking some of these givens in education? That, that education, a school, a student, students' education is defined by the number of courses they have. That's a great. De- that's a great design question, right? How about we yeah. rethink that? Um, you know, and I agree with you. The, the more, the more outcomes that we can pretend, I mean, kids are. You know, my work right now, uh, the, the schools that I are in contact with, you know, it's very obvious that the pandemic had a, a really huge impact on them, mostly on their motivation and their willingness to learn and participate. They're sort of disengaged. Yeah. I think, sure. and I don't know what that's going to mean as they go through the remainder of their education and into into adulthood and so on. But um, we need to, we need to. I mean, we have to figure out new ways to engage kids. Yeah, uh, and new pathways. I mean, this is this is the paramount importance in education. That you know, I don't. You know, the world doesn't need more accountants. With apologies to accountants. But it needs more committed, dedicated uh, individuals that want to make a difference in people's lives and their own. We need people that are going to support democracy and be participatory citizens. You know, we don't need more kids to go and go get saddled by lifetime debt and go get for a four-year degree that may or may not, you know, give a job Chain or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's the outcome. It, you know, I get really, you know, at one particular time we were you're going to get me into an area where I probably shouldn't go, but. Uh, Typical of my style, right? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we had this thing called industrial education where we prepared kids for jobs, right? Right. Okay. Now we have college and career readiness. What right. are we preparing kids for? Jobs. In yeah. a lot of ways, I'm making an argument that college and career readiness to focus on is just industrial age education where skin and make it more palatable. That's it. That's, that's my opinion, not, not the opinion of Jeff Utek and the podcast. Yeah, right. No, I love it. <laughs> So. I love it. Yeah, I agree. And so I think the last question then is this idea, like, do you, do you think that the, like the approach of the design thinking classroom, do you think that is this, is this type of learning, do you think going to be the future of our education? Are we crossing our fingers or do you think it'll always remain kind of a, a, a kind of a niche teaching model? Well, uh, to, to give you an answer on that, I, I think it's only a, a niche in education. And what I mean by that is that everything you use on a daily basis from your toothbrush to your automobile, to your iPhone has been through a design process and some things are better designed than others. So when you look at the ways in which people work and create things and build things is through design. Yeah. Everything is designed. Uh, so it's not a niche outside of education. It's a niche inside of education. When you take a look at education, and you look at a lot of high schools, kids are still learning in rows. So that nobody learns like that outside. Of, that's a niche for education. You know, that's yeah. uh, the, probably one of the most inauthentic ways in which you can learn. Uh, uh, so do I see it? I mean, if, if you truly want to think about engaging kids in really meaningful ways, you'll consider an exploration of design. It might not be the answer for you. Um, maybe perhaps it's problem-based learning. But nobody design, nobody creates things. You don't go to an organization, a corporate organization, and say, they say, hey, we just designed this product from problem-based learning. That doesn't happen. You know, so right. that's sort of a, um, you know, the design is the, is the real process. Given that, uh, realistically, it's, it's going to remain... You know, it's it can be in a single classroom, as the book suggests, and it can make that a reality. Uh, you're going to have opportunities, like I said, to think about this in the, like a smaller school and academy kind of thing. It's a great thing for a charter, um, for an established school that has a hundred year tradition of education. Um, I'm working with a school and I had discussions with a very, a very good school in Chicago. It's a great school, actually, that are looking at ways in which, you know, how do we inter- interject human-centered design as a concept in all our classes? What are the elements that are part of human-centered design that are valuable that we can start bringing into the classroom? For example, like a focus on empathetic relationships and understanding those and establishing those. So maybe perhaps it's not the entire design process. But maybe it's components of that. They, you know, so what I what here's what I'm where I'm going with this is that 
in the book and in my thinking now, I sidestep the conversations around change. Hmm. Um, when you go into schools, change is a bad word for educators, in my opinion, because a lot of times it's a, you, got, you have to change doing what you're doing. And in a lot of ways that says what you're not doing is effective with kids. And one of the things right. we have to emphasize is that schools have served kids in the right way for decades. And we have much to be provo- proud about as a profession because we've done a great job preparing kids. It's a different world today. Kids need different skills and dispositions to make sense of that world. It's completely unpredictable. It's you have this networked kind of ecology where an opportunity like this book goes on Amazon. Anybody in the world can buy that. That didn't exist 20 yeah. years ago. So we can't continue to teach in the same way that when I learned in high school back in the 70s. <laughs> um, and even further along than that, because it's you know, we just can't get on the global pandemic. Things the whole equation is different. Yeah. So um, the more we connect, connect kids to different kinds of opportunities, whether that's design or otherwise, is always a good thing. But I, th- I think the times demand a different kind of model and the consideration of design is appropriate for, for schools that want to make a difference in kids. Uh, again, how that works and what that looks like in, a, in schools, Jeff, is actually a design question. Yeah, so it, it, regarding every single school that's out there, how might we start thinking about the principles of design thinking or design? And what does that mean for the kind of educational experience we offer? And because the answer to that is every is different for every different organization and how they might approach that. Uh, so the answer to your question is, it's appropriate, but it can be scaled based on design approach to the needs of every school that's interested in considering that. Yeah. And I'll go back to this school district that I'm working with here in the state of Washington. It's one of our fastest growing districts to the point where they have more kids in portables than they do in actual classrooms because they can't literally they're growing so fast and they're looking at it they're very much. And they've approached the whole thing from a design thinking. They just passed a bond for their third high school. They built two high schools in the past. Like this is number three, but the second one they just built, I think five years ago and it's already overflowing, but they're also looking at coming out of the pandemic. What, We know that online learning, and this is them, we know that online learning worked for some of our kids. Yeah. How do we make that part of high school as well? So they've got, they've got, not only do they have, we call them the big box schools. They're going to have three big box high schools, all 2000 plus for those kids that that works for. They have another school that is uh, basically 80% the kids do online, 20% of the time the kids come to class. They've got almost 800 kids that have chosen that that is their learning. And it is set up differently. The curriculum is different. The teacher's time is different. Uh, To use your, you know, this word that we don't like, but this idea of a facilitator, this idea of a coach on the side, kids are going through learning on their own. They have another program that is students are doing the learning online, but are physically inside the school. And that is a K-14 program that they have. That's a growing kind of perspective. Yeah. Yeah. They're also building with the new bond they just passed. They're building a small design thinking high school that they hope is going to have around eight to 900 kids in it. And it's specifically built uh, for that type of learning. And so the idea is, is that here's a large public school district who is starting to understand coming out of the pandemic, we need to create different types of schools for different types of kids. And that hasn't been it, right? Like before this, it was you had your high school and then you had the alternative school. And the alternative school was just for the kids that got kicked out of the big school or couldn't show up on time for, you know, period one. And so we just sent them over there to the other school. And what they're starting to understand is we need all these multiple different schools in order to meet the needs of, of, of our growing and very diverse population. They're also uh, the, the school district here that is the largest Hispanic population outside of California uh, on the West Coast. Right? Well, that's so a, you know, that's a, very fascinating that's a extremely healthy approach. And, you know, I'd be a big supporter of that, you know, it, you know, going back to the notion of change, you know, and I've, I was meant to say this, I forgot uh, this book, you know, and I sort of like I sidestep change, but going to your example, and to what the book tries to do is is focus on how do you advance the educational experience that you offer? You know, and, and that's growing your capacity. That's adding a couple of new schools to give kids choices at that sy- systems level experience. You know, or it can be in a classroom where you're where you're providing new ways in which kids can engage in more authentic ways to learn. So 
that's really intriguing. The example you should, you mentioned, because I think that really literally if is the model is, is to, you know, in, in academies are nothing new to education. They've been around right. for a long time. Uh, but uh, the more, the more compelling question is, is how do we structure choice into the school day and then give kids opportunities to learn in the ways which makes sense for them. You know, you've got 30 kids, you know, you, you, you know, you, you know, you're sitting looking at a class, you've got 30 different kids. They all have different backgrounds, different family lives, right. different skills, different ability to learn. And so why not have different options for kids? We, we have to move. If, if anything comes out of this, this last couple of years experience, it's, it's understanding that, that, one is that schools are places where kids need to to go to every day to meet to assemble to spend time together to meet the committed adults that are going to help them learn, but also that there's there's a wide range of kids that are interested in learning in different ways. You know, one size fits all isn't isn't it anymore? Yeah, you know, the mention about uh, the online learning the the research supports that. There's a lot of school districts where the parents have said, "My kid did well. Let's have an online. Let's have an yeah, online school. Exactly. You know, why not?" Why you know, the, th- the thing that I love about that is this, in, in businesses have realized this as a result of the pandemic too, is that you no longer are governed by a 30 mile radius in terms of where you hire teachers. If you have an online school, you can hire me to teach biology in Chicago if you're in Seattle right. or any, or me to teach design, you know, so, so you can hire the best person in the world to teach a class for your kids. And it's not governed by geography anymore. So what a compelling yeah. kind of question and way to change what kids experience. I love that. Yeah. I love that. David, it is always great to talk with you. The author of the book, The Design Thinking Classroom. Of course, you can get that over on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Absolutely. Uh, David, as we get ready to wrap this up, if people wanted to reach out to you to learn more about you, maybe contact you to come in and, and do an audit of the school or, or come in and do, support the school, what's the best way for people to... Uh, you can email me at David. It's a re- This is really... Uh, uh, easy email, right? It's david at davidjakesdesigns.com. Or you can just go to my website at davidjakesdesigns.com and just fill out the contact form. I'm glad to contact with you and talk to you about, about what you're doing. Thank you for asking. Awesome. And, we'll, and we'll make sure all of that is in the show notes as well. David, it is great to catch up with you, my friend. Uh, you still owe me that steak, steak, steak bud. I'm coming yeah, and steak. I owe you a steak. Next time you're out, it's Seattle way. You just remind me. I'll come pick you up at the airport. Do, and take you I will out do that. Statement. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's great catching up. Uh, congratulations on the new book and uh, all of your success. And uh, we'll chat some more. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.